Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we've got something interesting to take a look at today. This looks like a little ThinkPad with a rather thick keyboard deck, but it is a little bit more than that because it is actually a 16-inch foldable PC from Lenovo. And they call this the ThinkPad Fold X116. And as you can see here, this thing folds out to a 16-inch OLED that you can prop up here with its included stand. And then when you're done, fold it up and have a nice little folio you can walk around with. So this is a kind of a neat new concept for a computer. I actually saw this at CES a year ago, but now this product is shipping. And we're going to take a look at all the different ways you can use it and how it performs. But before we get into this, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this foldable is all about. Now, the price point on this is rather high at $3,200 as configured. They do have a base model that comes with just the tablet portion here, but our version has the built-in extended battery. It also has the keyboard and track point combo along with the pen. So you will be spending quite a bit to get this machine fully decked out. But it is fun, I think, to look at new concepts for personal computers because we don't see too many new ideas lately. So I was excited to check this out to see what the future might hold for us. Now this particular model has last year's Intel processor, an i5-1260U. It has 16 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM. That RAM is not upgradable. It also has a 512 gigabyte SSD. There are a couple of different configuration options available that you can find when you are building your unit. Uh, so you do have some choices for RAM and processor configuration. Now this has a gorgeous 16.3 inch foldable OLED display. It runs at 2560 by 2024, four by three aspect ratio. We currently have it in that four by three aspect ratio here folded out. It runs with 100% of DCI-P3, so if you are doing creative work, the color should be calibrated nicely. It has 400 nits of brightness in its regular mode here. In HDR mode, you can get up to 600 nits for different portions of the image. So not terribly bright, but it looks really good, and I found it to be uh, working quite well indoors where I have been testing it. It is, of course, foldable, and one of the things that you won't see too easily on here is the crease. We looked at a couple of foldable phones recently, most recently the Pixel Fold, and that uh, crease was quite noticeable. I can definitely feel it here, and we'll talk about that when we get into the pen portion, but it's really hard to see the crease when you're staring at the screen. And again, you saw how nicely flat that this display folds up into. Now you have a bunch of different ways you can use this, and that's one of the fun things about this. So I can flip it over here into Tate mode, and we'll have some fun with that in a minute. And if I pull up a uh, web browser image here, you can see just how much screen real estate you have to work with. Now it weighs about 2.38 pounds by itself. That's about 1.26 kilograms. It does get a bit heavy to hold in one hand, but you can of course configure it and contort it in ways that can make it more comfortable to hold. But I do like having uh, this much vertical screen real estate here uh, to play around with. The keyboard and the stand uh, weigh about 1.38 pounds together or 630 grams. So all in, not all that much to travel with and it all folds up pretty nicely here. The keyboard and the stand though do kind of sit separate. So when you fold up the uh, machine here into its portable mode, you then have to fold the stand up like this and kind of carry it around as a sandwich. It does uh, magnetically attach to it at least, so it stays together for the most part, but the keyboard and stand are always going to be separate from the folded up computer. The stand itself isn't bad. Um, it is a little on the um, delicate side insofar as it'll collapse when you go too far with it. So if I put my computer back out here, and get it all situated. If I go up too high here, it kind of just falls apart. So you definitely have to be careful when you're setting it up. This is about the best angle that I could get with it. Um, so it's hard to get it like uh, up a little higher than that. But generally for what I've been doing with it, it's been fine. But I was struggling a bit more with the stand than I would like. And then of course you've got the keyboard portion here. 
And let me show you what happens when you put the keyboard on top of the display. So I have it right now in its laptop configuration where you've got the camera up top here. Without the keyboard attached, you can pull up the on-screen keyboard here to type things in. And then if you hit Command Z, you can use the uh, built-in window organization that's part of Windows 11 to get things situated where you want. The cool thing though is that when you attach the physical keyboard, it detects its presence. So let me give you my overhead view here and we'll place the keyboard down on top. And when you do that, it will reconfigure everything so that your start menu appears just above the keyboard here and then it disables the lower portion of the display and then you can use the track point or the trackpad to navigate around. So it basically turns it into a little widescreen 12 inch laptop, which I think is pretty nice. And then if you need a bigger screen, you just pull the keyboard off, unfold it, and you've got a much bigger display at your disposal. And it does this switch very, very quickly, which was nice to see. The keyboard itself feels a little cramped for a ThinkPad, but you get used to it pretty quickly. The keys at least are full size. And I think for me, the difference here is that you don't have a place for your wrist to rest. So my wrists are kind of hanging off the edge here. But of course, you can detach the keyboard and just use it wirelessly lower on the desk if you want. And then, of course, you pick up more screen real estate in the process. So there's a lot of different ways to use this thing. Surprisingly, there's a good amount of depth to the keys. This won't be as deep as some of the larger ThinkPads, but it's a lot deeper than you would think given how thin the keyboard actually is, as you can see here. So that was a nice surprise. They do have some felt here on the back so it doesn't scratch the screen when it attaches. So that was a nice touch. The trackpad is a tactile uh, trackpad, so it doesn't actually push down. It will click when you press it, although I would have liked to have had a little bit more tactile feedback come back from the trackpad. You can set it to go a little higher, which is what I did but I would have liked something just a little bit stronger as I am clicking on it. The track point, of course, works as well. And what you can do is configure the top portion of the trackpad here to perform like the physical buttons do on a regular ThinkPad, where this is the left click, this is the right click, and then here you've got your scrolling. It does take a little bit of getting used to because you really can't feel where those buttons should be. And of course, the trackpad doesn't actually move, but after a while, I think you can kind of get the hang of it, and it's nice that they uh, stayed true to the ThinkPad line here with that nub in the middle. The keyboard is backlit. It also has a fingerprint reader on board, and the webcam here will also uh, do facial recognition for logging in. So just another neat way that you can configure this device to work as a laptop. You do, though, need to be careful not to fold it up while the keyboard is attached because you can damage it. So make sure you take that keyboard off before you fold it up and walk away. Now, even when the keyboard is physically attached to the computer, it is communicating over Bluetooth wirelessly. So you do need to charge this independently of the computer. You can, of course, plug it into the computer if you want to charge it. It'll also work over USB-C instead of Bluetooth when you do that. But just remember to plug this thing in every couple of days to make sure it doesn't die on you when you're out in the field. Speaking of ports, there are a couple of them on here. You have a Thunderbolt port here on the left-hand side, at least as I have it configured at the moment. On the front here, you've got another Thunderbolt 4 port. And of course, you can use these for a variety of different things, including external graphics if you want. You can output to external displays. You can, of course, also use Thunderbolt devices on it as well. So lots of flexibility with those full function ports. And of course, you can charge the device through those ports as well. Additionally, it has a full service USB-C 3.2 port over here. This will also allow you to charge the device. So you generally have a port conveniently located for you, no matter which mode you have this in. So that was good to see on there. But those ports are the only ports that this has. Battery life on this unit with the extra battery that's built in is about nine to 10 hours, depending on what you're doing. These OLED displays do consume a good amount of power, so you'll probably want to keep the brightness down if you want to try to get the full battery length out of this. And of course, if you're doing more strenuous activities like video editing or gaming, that will eat into the battery more significantly. Now, the webcam on here is pretty nice. It runs at a 1440p resolution max at 30 frames per second. Got a little washed out under my studio lights here, but you can see it's got a very nice level of clarity and I think it'll work well for doing conference calls and those sorts of things. 
One thing that I did run into on this was that I was having trouble recording things in the right orientation. So when you are using this on Zoom or one of the other conferencing apps, things will be fine because I think the computer is doing some stuff to keep everything oriented properly. But for some reason, when I was recording video inside of the Microsoft Camera app, it was always coming out in the wrong orientation. So just bear that in mind. But other than that, I think the webcam on this is pretty nice and should work well for conferencing. Let's take a look now and see how the pen performs. Now, mine came with a Lenovo Precision pen. One of my issues with these pens is that there is a big button here that it usually uses for erasing. That's right where I typically hold the pen. So I often have to adjust my orientation to make sure I don't hit it by accident. I found the pen works fine here. I'm using the Microsoft Whiteboard app right now. It is able to detect the presence of the pen and ignore my wrist and other touch inputs while the pen is close. One thing you will notice though is that there is a noticeable bump here in the middle of the screen. You can't see it, but you can feel it. And that's where, of course, the fold is. That's where that crease goes. So it's probably not gonna be the best for precision artwork just because it's not a uniform flat surface from one end to the other. But if you stick to uh, these sides, you'll be fine. It's just down the middle here that you're gonna feel a little bit of a bump. But if you're just taking notes on it, it should be fine. And you've got a very nice, large, calibrated display here to work with. Now you saw we had a web browser up here earlier. We'll pull it back up here and visit the nasa.gov homepage. This does have a Wi-Fi 6E radio on board. So if you have a modern access point, you'll be able to take advantage of that. Everything here, I think, runs very, very smoothly and very, very quickly. So if you are doing basic tasks here like web browsing and word processing and everything, you should be fine. A little bit earlier, I pulled up my YouTube channel and we were able to get a 1080p 60 video running here just fine with no drop frames or anything out of the ordinary. There were a couple of drop frames at the outset, but afterwards it settled right down. One thing to note on one of these displays is that uh, this does run at a four by three aspect ratio. So when you're watching content that is shot in a 16 by nine aspect ratio, you will have some letterboxing top and bottom here just by the nature of the display. So that's one thing to keep in mind. This is very much the same screen orientation as your old standard definition television, but you can have some fun with that. Let's take a look at that after we look at the benchmark results from the browserbench.org speedometer test. And on that test, we got a score of 337. So it's very much on par with other Intel chips from this generation. So now it's on to the fun stuff as promised. Right now we are running MAME, which is an arcade emulator, and it's playing an old 80s game called Zaxxon that I used to play at my local bowling alley. And many of the old 80s arcade games were designed on these square four by three aspect ratio displays, except the developers of those games flipped the displays over to have them run a little taller. And check it out, because this is a four by three display, you get instant tate mode, as we like to call it, and you can play arcade games the way they were designed. That's worth $3,200 right there, I think, but it's really cool. It works great here. I'm running the RetroArch version of MAME and all of the arcade games that I tested have all worked great here uh, in this vertical mode. Whoa, so there you go. You can also see how volatile that stand can be too. So you gotta be really careful when you get this thing set up. Let's take a look at some more modern stuff now. So here is Red Dead Redemption 2. We are running this at 1080p at the lowest settings and we're getting about 20 to 25 frames per second here. So you're not gonna run a lot of modern AAA titles on this all that well, but it does actually feel playable. And I think if you went down to a lower resolution, you could probably get around 30 frames per second on this game, maybe a little bit better. So it's performing pretty much in line where we've seen other i5 chips from this generation perform. Not bad actually, but of course not really well suited for higher end gaming here. And on the 3D Mark Times by Benchmark test, we got a score of 1,071. This score is actually in line with what I would expect out of this processor. Now we did run the 3D Mark stress test and there we got a passing grade of 99.8%, which would indicate that there's no real throttling going on. However, this is a fanless design and I did notice throttling when we had that game up for a longer stretch of time. You can see here after a few minutes, we went from 20 to 25 frames per second down to nine or 10 frames per second. So there's definitely 
uh, some throttling going on. It's unavoidable uh, given the fact that this is a fanless design and the only way it can really dissipate a lot of heat from heavy duty usage is through throttling that processor down to make it run a little cooler. But nonetheless, it still performs quite nicely, I think, for the tasks it was really designed for. And it's very nice to have a machine that performs well without any noise from fans getting in the way. Now, in fairness, we did have it flat on the desk earlier. I do believe it's designed to work in this propped up orientation to give it some airflow around it to get some of that heat out of the way. But again, I think you will encounter some throttling if you keep it under heavy sustained load all the time. I did want to try doing some video editing on here, though. This is DaVinci Resolve. We're running a 4K 60 frames per second project here. And as you can see, it's doing simple edits and cuts quite nicely in real time without any slowdown. So I think you'll be able to edit the types of video that I do on this channel pretty well on here without any real lag or slowdown. If you do anything more advanced, you might want to consider getting an external GPU to plug into one of its Thunderbolt ports to help with some of the graphics processing. Now the speaker system on this isn't bad considering how thin the overall package is. There are three speakers, only two of them are active based on the orientation of the device. You don't get a lot of bass out of these, but you get a good range of sound and very nice stereo separation. It's also adequately loud, so I think it'll do well for you know, watching a few videos or doing uh, web conferences, but if you wanted to get better quality audio, I would use a pair of Bluetooth headphones. Now I did boot up the latest version of Ubuntu on this and some things work and some things don't. So the good news is that the touch screen is working here properly. If I adjust the orientation, it will flip it over. But some of the more advanced things that you saw earlier, like having it detect the placement of the keyboard did not work. The Wi-Fi did work properly, except the audio is not working on here. So there are some things that are not gonna work as elegantly on the Linux side as they will on the Windows side, but it does at least run these things and the screen will, for the most part, cooperate with what you're trying to do on the orientation side of things. So where am I at here with the X1 Fold? Well, it is rather expensive. I would love for it to cost less money. And I'm finding the things that I like about it are very similar to what I liked about the Pixel Fold phone that we looked at recently, which is that you got something really portable, but you can have a bigger screen when you need it. So for example, if you're on a plane, you don't have a lot of room, you can put the keyboard on here and get a very nice functional little 12 inch laptop, but then you can take the keyboard off, take the stand out, and suddenly you've got a 16 inch display when you have more room to work with, like when you get to your hotel room. So that I like quite a bit. And that was also what I liked about all these foldable phones that we're seeing. You can get a bigger screen when you need it without the penalty of walking around with something that's too big. My only gripe here is that I would love to see a better stand mechanism, maybe something built into the back of the unit itself, because the stand doesn't give me all the angles that I want, and it tends to collapse a little too easily. But that's somewhat fixable, I think. In fact, they could probably come up with a different stand that would work with the existing hardware. But beyond that, it seems to be working quite nicely. I like the fact that I don't see a very visible crease in the middle. The image quality on the OLED is excellent and altogether a pretty nice product here and hopefully something we see more of in the future at lower prices. That's gonna do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.